All right, good morning everyone. Last time I spoke to you, you, uh, you saw my Roman side. Today you're going to see my Protestant side um, for this session and the next. Um, we are going to begin with prayer. Um, we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer and we are going to sing it as it would have been sung in some communities in the 16th century. Um, you are invited to sing along with me if you don't know the tune. Um, by the time we get to the end, I think you very well might know the tune. So you are, uh, as I said, you're welcome to, uh, to join in this prayer with me. Oh, let me get rid of something here. There we go. Our Father, which in heaven art, and makest us all one brotherhood, to call upon thee with one heart, our heavenly Father and our God, grant we pray not with lips alone, but with a heart's deep sigh and groan. Thy blessed name be sanctified, thy holy word might us inflame, in holy life for to abide, to magnify thy holy name, from all errors defend and keep the little flock of thy poor sheep. Thy kingdom come even at this hour, and henceforth everlastingly. Thine Holy Ghost into us power, with all his gifts most plenteously, from Satan's rage and filthy band, defend us with thy mighty hand. Thy will be done with diligence, like as in heaven, in earth also. In trouble grant us patience, thee to obey in wealth and woe. Let not flesh, blood, or any ill prevail against thy holy will. Give us this day our daily bread and all other gifts of thine. Keep us from war and from bloodshed, also from sickness, dearth, and pine, that we may live in quietness without all greedy carefulness. Forgive us our offenses all, relieve our careful conscience, 
As we forgive both great and small, which unto us have done offense, prepare us, Lord, for thee, serve thee in perfect love and unity. O Lord, into temptation, lead us not when the fiend doth rage, to withstand his invasion. Give power and strength to every age. Arm and make strong thy feeble host with faith and with the Holy Ghost. O Lord, from evil deliver us. The days and times are dangerous. From everlasting death save us, and in our last need comfort us. A blessed end to us bequeath. Into thy hands our souls receive. For thou, O Lord, art King of kings, and thou hast power o'er all, all, all. Thy glory shineth in all things, in the wide world universal. Amen. Let it be done, O Lord, that we have prayed with one accord. Anybody want to venture a guess from which Reformed tradition this comes from? There are three good answers. One correct, but three very good answers. Nico. Is it a Lutheran chorale? So you think it comes from Luther? I think so. Yeah, it is a Lutheran chorale. That is, that is one of the great answers. Um, it actually, the tune is Vater Unser in Himmelreich, which was written by uh, Martin Luther um, to accompany the uh, Lord's Prayer um, in a metrical version in German. But this version actually does not come from Luther, but they did borrow Luther's tune. So excellent answer. Anybody else? It is the Anglican Church. That's the correct answer. The other good answer I was looking for would have been the Reformed Church, one of the Reformers, Calvinists, because as we, uh, as we know, Calvin liked his metrical psalms, and he also uh, put metrical versions of the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Creed. Um, that would have been another great answer. But this actually comes from the Church of England, from a book called The Whole Book of Psalms, collected into English, um, which was printed by John Day in 1562. This image actually comes from the Beinecke. The Beinecke has a wonderful copy, copy of this, uh, the original first edition from 1562 that's in pristine condition. Um, completed in 1562, uh, this Psalter contains metrical versions of all 150 Psalms, Canticles, the Creed, the Decalogue, and the Lord's Prayer. These appear in prose, in other words chant form, as well as metrical versions. Um, over here we see a version of Psalm 23. You can see it's in common meter. 
My shepherd is the living Lord, nothing therefore I need. In pastures fair, near pleasant streams, he setteth me to feed. You can see how the second and the fourth lines rhyme. Um, Sternhold was a very popular Psalter. It had gone through more than 600 editions. The last was printed in 1828, so it lasted over 250 years. It was brought over to the American colonies where it was used, particularly in the South, until the close of the 18th century. Uh, what else do we have here? Here is the, uh, the version of, uh, that we just sang, the uh, Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, in uh, a metrical version. Why did they provide both prose and metrical versions of the Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer? These three texts became the basis of the Catechism. They contain the fundamentals of Christian belief, so they have catechetical as well as liturgical value. Um, for the average churchgoer in England, and by that I mean those who were outside of cathedrals or collegiate churches, uh, just the uh, average per parish, um, I would argue that Sternhold and Hopkins was a liturgical book of equal importance to the Book of Common Prayer. This is what they would have been singing week after week. Um, I talked a little bit about metrical psalms last class, so I won't belabor the point, but I will point you to um, to uh, Martin Tell's excellent essay that you uh, that you were assigned from our uh, from our text, I find it very telling that Martin Tell, whereas every all the other chapters talk about the uh, history of the Eucharist and of baptism, uh, Martin Tell pretty much spends the entire chapter chapter talking about metrical psalmody because it was that important. It was something that the people would have noticed right away in the 16th century. In the medieval church, music was provided either by a cantor or by the scola. The people did not sing. Um, they might have perhaps responded with the chanted Amen, but other than that, um, you know, it was the choir or the scola that provided the music. In the Reformation, the congregation became the choir. That was a very, very significant development. And not only that, but both the men and the women would have been singing the psalms. And that was actually controversial at first because a lot of people argued that women's voices should not be heard in the liturgy, but Calvin disagreed with that. He said, no, everybody should be singing the biblical psalms. It is the prayer book of the church. All right. Enough on Psalms. Here we have a wonderful image. Uh, this is from uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, um, and it's entitled The Temple Well Purged. Uh, this image also comes from uh, the Beinecke. The Beinecke has uh, several copies of, uh, of Fox's Book of Martyrs. It was a, uh, it was a um, very, very popular book. Propaganda, if you will. And this one is entitled, The Temple Well Purged. And on the top, you see the burning of images. They wanted to cleanse their churches of all the images. Uh, and then uh, the ship off to the Romish church. Ship off your trinkets. Um, be packing you papists, it says. The papists packing away their paltry. So the Church of England, it did not want all the, uh, the, the, the Roman relics and all that, but it wanted a temple well purged. Um, what is the temple well purged? Well, you have here the two things, baptism and the Eucharist. That was the main thing. Um, here in this corner, you see the king being presented with a book. Anybody want to guess what book that is? I'm sorry? Book of Common Prayer. That's what I would have thought at first until I looked very closely and I see it says Bible. So it was not the Book of Common Prayer, but the Bible that was so important to the Reformation. Over here, you see the communion table, but people are not gathered around the communion table. You see the paten and the chalice, um, but the body of Christ is to be found in the community gathered. And what is the community gathering doing? They're listening to a sermon, so preaching at least according to this woodcut here, it is the preaching that was of extreme importance. And over here, you do see people gathered around the font. That was another big thing during the Reformation. Private baptisms were discouraged, and they should be done in public. So there you see more of a public um, 
you see more of a public uh, baptism. But the emphasis was the Bible and the emphasis was on preaching. Uh, many people refer to this as the importance of sola scriptura, the battle cry of the Reformation. Now, to use the word of Aidan Kavanaugh, um, the interest in the Bible and preaching didn't drop down from heaven in a glad bag in the 16th century, but it had medieval precedents. And uh, we will turn just for a moment to the importance of Wycliffe. Wycliffe, who lived from 1330 to about 1384. He was not the first person to translate the Bible into English. Um, earlier translations, however, were partial translations, especially of the Psalms, or allegorical renderings of Bible stories into the vernacular. Wycliffe, however, was the first to undertake a complete translation of the Bible into English. Note that his source was not the original biblical languages of Hebrew or Greek, but the Latin Vulgate. Uh, Wycliffe finished translating the Bible, or more accurately, overseeing the translation of the Bible, for it is believed that he did not work alone, but he completed this by 1382. After his death, updated versions continued to appear, many of which bear the editorial site of John Purvey, who was one of Wycliffe's assistants. Uh, this copy, again from Beinecke, um, it was written in Gothic bookhand in Middle English on parchment and it contains the Gospels and the Epistles. This document, it is believed, or this manuscript dates from about 1400. Um, we are looking at the Gospel of John, which appears right there, uh, right under the red. And I will read it. Um, this is the best I could decipher. In the beginning was the Word that is God's Son. The Word was at God, and God was the Word. This was in the beginning at God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was, and then it becomes very unclear. You can see this manuscript is a work in progress. You note the erasures here. So someone was about to put in a uh, correction, perhaps. I find it very interesting that this line here is underlined. Someone said, wait a sec, that is not in the Vulgate. The Vulgate just said, in the beginning was the Word. It does not say, in the beginning was the Word that is God's Son. So that whoever was translating it put in sort of their own words. Um, it's not a good translation. Um, and that's because they really try to do a transliteration of the Latin. Wycliffe and his assistants try to remain as faithful to the Latin as possible. Um, and sometimes in the manuscript you will even see where there was no good translation of the Latin, they just continued with the Latin word. But the importance was to come up with a faithful translation of the entire Bible. So here are some takeaways from the Wycliffe Bible. It was a process and it involved many people over time. It was the whole Bible that was translated, not just sections. It was translated in a language which people could understand. Uh, Middle English was the language of the peasants. Those who were educated, of course, would have spoken language, uh, Latin. Another language that was common during the time was French. But uh, Middle English, that was considered a very vulgar language. It was the language of the peasants, but that is what Wycliffe chose to translate it into. You can see that it's almost intended for study. Um, it, uh, scripture was the foundation of belief in uh, Wycliffe's theology. It was a book of study. It was not a liturgical book. There was no evidence that the Wycliffe Bible was read publicly in worship. Um, it caused a lot of controversy, which is understandable, in the medieval church, and I believe in, I think it was 1408, in England there was an injunction put in place that nobody could translate any part of the Bible without um, approval of the state and the church. Um, so uh, there were no other translations until Tyndale in the uh, early 16th century. Tyndale 
Um, his uh, translations appear in 1526 and 1534. Um, Tyndale relied on the Hebrew and the Greek rather than the Vulgate. Um, he was well versed in, in, uh, in, in Greek, uh, not as well versed in Hebrew, but he traveled to the continent, to Germany, where he actually worked with some rabbis in order to understand better the Hebrew scriptures. Um, it was also, a, you know, a, a prudent thing for him to travel to Germany because the injunction not to translate was still in place in England, so uh, he was safer in Germany, although he eventually did uh, die for his efforts and he was burned at the stake. Um, and then the next translation happened soon after, 1535, by Miles Coverdale. Um, Coverdale incorporated much of the work done by Tyndale, especially in the New Testament. Um, his Old Testament, however, was based on Luther's translation into German. Um, here we see the Bible becoming more of a liturgical book because Coverdale's Psalms were used by Cranmer in his Book of Common Prayer. And they're a wonderful translation of the Psalms and they continue to be used in some churches to this very day. In fact, if you go to uh, St. Thomas in New York City, uh, that's where one of my boys sings in the choir, they chant the uh, Psalms in Anglican chant to Coverdale's translations. Um, and it's very beloved there. Uh, a couple years later, in 1537, another Bible appeared. This is called Matthew's Bible. It was the work of John Rogers. Uh, it incorporated much of Tyndale again and also some of Coverdale's. It was a problematic book um, in that he added a lot of marginal notations um, to the text where he gave his own opinions. Um, and so it was, uh, it was criticized. Um, but then King Henry VIII commissioned uh, the Great Bible in 1539, and uh, that was the work of Coverdale. Uh, the requirements was that it had to be a large Bible. It couldn't be a small one. I think the Matthews Bible was very small, um, but, the, uh, but the, the, the Great Bible was very large. Um, and each parish was required to have one. And in fact, the custom was that each parish would have a Bible, and eventually when the Book of Common Prayer was completed, they would have a Book of Common Prayer in the church. Uh, they were chained down to prevent people from taking them, but they were there for everybody to go and look at and read and, uh, and, and to pray. Um, the Great Bible from 1539, that eventually became the English Bible that was read publicly during the liturgy. So this is the first liturgical Bible in English, you could say. Now, along with Bible translations into the vernacular, the medieval church saw great growth in vernacular preaching. The Franciscan and Dominican friars um, traveled and gave vernacular sermons, often based on the gospel of the day. They were delivered outside of mass, often before the Mass. At this time, the clergy were not trained in, uh, in, in homiletics or in biblical studies or anything like that. Um, they were just trained to say Mass um, and, to, uh, and, and to offer the sacraments. Um, so preaching wasn't something done by the, uh, by, by the local parish priest. It was the monks who traveled around and did that. Uh, here we see a Franciscan monk elevated here in the pulpit. He's preaching. Um, you will see that it is a diverse group of people. You have the women as well as the men, according to the custom. Unfortunately, the women were stuck on the floor while the men got the benches. Um, you can also see that there are clergy here, including what appears to be a bishop, as well as lay people. Um, actually, it looks like there's two bishops here, three. Um, so, so it was a diverse group, but the sermon would have been delivered in uh, the vernacular and it was a way to get the people, all people, to, uh, to understand the gospel of the day. Um, if we forward to the uh, early 16th century, we see that vernacular preaching was also now exercised by local clergy. Um, there was one person by the name of John Ulrich Surgant. I think I'm saying that correctly, but I don't know. He was a well-known preacher, a pastor, and also a professor in Zurich. In 1502, 
he published Manuale Curaturo. And this manual includes a liturgy devised by him, although it was probably based on earlier sources, but it was uh, devised by him for the revival of preaching in a congregational liturgical context. Sorgan's intention was not to depreciate the mass rite, but to provide a separate preaching rite that might perhaps precede the mass. The liturgical structure is as follows. It begins with a Latin greeting and the sermon text given in Latin. And then the German greeting is given with the sermon text in German. You have an invocation of the Holy Spirit, a prayer of epiclesis, if you will, over the word. And then you have the sermon. After the sermon, you have parish notices that probably would have included um, a commemoration of those who had died during the previous week. And then you would have prayers of the church. Often these included prayers for political, um, for rulers, those in authority. And then it would conclude with the Lord's Prayer and the Hail Mary. This was followed by the Apostles' Creed, the Decalogue, and it ended with confession. Often we think of worship as beginning with confession, but Surgant decided that the public confession should conclude the liturgy. And then you have the dismissal. So these are sort of medieval precedents to preaching services in the vernacular. Now at long last, we come to what we often think of as the Reformation. We come to our first 16th century reformer, Ulrich Zwingli. He lived from 1484 to 1531. He died young. Um, he was uh, an army chaplain and he died in battle in 1531. <clears throat> Zwingli was a priest at the Großmünster in Zurich and he was uh, one of the big leaders of the Swiss Reformation. He attacked such things as fasting during Lent, clerical celibacy, images in churches, and music at public worship. It's interesting that he took away all music in public worship because of all the 16th century reformers, Zwingli was the most musical. In fact, uh, we have a few of his uh, songs um, that he composed. So he loved music. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and he used it, but outside of church. And perhaps that might be an indication why he did not want music in church, because he realized the power that music could have over the emotions and things like that. And he believed that preaching was the most important thing. So he banned all churches. Um, churches were cleansed, all the relics were taken out and burned, organs were dismantled, the walls of the churches were whitewashed. Theologically, he opposed the doctrine of transubstantiation as well as the notion of the sacrifice of the Mass. But we will look at the reforms of the Mass at our next class. Today we're going to focus on the Word and preaching. Zwingli began his program of expository preaching in 1519, starting with the book of Matthew. Now this is significant because in the medieval church, of course, we have the lectionaries where the, uh, where, where the Bible is, is, is sort of divided into lections or selections. It's a practice known as Lectio Selecta. Um, and then different um, Gospels would appear on different Sundays um, and it would probably follow the liturgical year. Um, Zwingli believed in expository preaching. He started at the beginning of the book and he would preach his way through the book verse by verse. Um, so with Matthew, um, he would have started with a genealogy. Um, hopefully he went through that rather quickly for the sake of his congregation so he could move on to the nativity story. He did not save the nativity story for Christmas. Um, Zwingli didn't celebrate Christmas. He threw out the liturgical year. You learned about the nativity when it appeared in the course of your preaching through the gospel. 
Um, and then you can imagine one of the next things that would come would have been the Sermon on the Mount. I could imagine Zwingli spending a lot of Sundays preaching his way through all that material. But that was sort of the, the scheme of preaching. It's a process, it's a, um, it's a um, method known as Lexio Continua as opposed to Lexio Selecta. Um, they believe Zwingli's sermons were about a half hour in length, so not that long, according to, uh, to uh, Reformation standards. Worship took a long time in the Reformation, as I'm sure you all experienced when we sang our opening prayer. That took some time to get through. It would have been very quicker, much quicker, just to recite the Lord's Prayer than to sing ten verses of it in, uh, in, in, uh, in metrical form. Uh, Zwingli also avoided using manuscripts. Um, he became a popular preacher and increased the popular knowledge of scripture among his followers. And this in many ways helped lay the foundation for the religious reforms that would follow. What did his preaching liturgy look like? In 1525 he published a form of prayer according to the teaching of St. Paul, according to, and the title runs on. It's about a 15 or 20 word title. Um, we will simply call it the Liturgy of the Word. So, it begins with prayer. The first part of the prayer asks that God will open his word. Um, the second part of the prayer is for all Christian rulers. The third part of the prayer is for those who are persecuted. That's followed by the Lord's Prayer and the Ave Maria. Then you would have a reading from Scripture along with the sermon. You would have an announcement of those who have died, if there were any, along with the prayer and then the general confession. Does this look familiar to anybody? This is very much an adaptation of Surgant's rite. And Surgant, as we knew, was also um, in Zurich a little bit earlier, 1502. And, uh, and so Zwingli was undoubtedly familiar with Surgant's liturgy, and he adopted it. Um, I find it very interesting that uh, Zwingli, who threw out all the images, stopped music and everything, included the uh, Ave Maria in his liturgy, but that of course would have been part of the popular piety of the time and would have been familiar to those who would have attended Surgant's um, Liturgy of the Word. Um, as you can see, this is a rather stark and somber liturgy, particularly with his general confession at the end, but again, that is based on Surgant. Um, the sole emphasis of this liturgy is the sermon. The prayers at the beginning were preparatory for the sermon, and the sermon itself would teach people to recognize their misery and assure them of forgiveness. Those are Zwingli's words. He said that the sermon was necessary for people to recognize their misery and assure them of forgiveness. There was no singing. There were no images to look at. There was no elaborate ritual. For Zwingli, worship was a cerebral rather than a multi-sensory event. Let's contrast this with Martin Luther. Oh, that's Calvin. I didn't prepare a slide on Luther. All right. Luther valued preaching as much as Zwingli and the rest of the reformers. However, he did not use uh, preaching liturgies like Surgent or Zwingli, but instead inserted preaching into the existing liturgies of Mass and the daily offices of Matins and Vespers. Quoting uh, Luther, since the chief and greatest aim of any service is to preach and teach the Word of God. So this was an addition of his. In the medieval rites, you wouldn't have sermons during the daily office. You wouldn't have preaching during the Mass. But Luther insisted that this become a part of all these services. 
According to his Deutsche Messe, this was written in 1525, translates to the German Mass, it's not so much a liturgical book as we would find with the Book of Common Prayer. It was a treatise. Um, he gave it as an example of how the German uh, how the Mass might be celebrated in German. And he also included a lot of information on how to do the other services, including the daily office. Um, according to this document, 1525 again, um, matins would begin with the chanting of psalms, which is exactly what they did in the medieval church. This was followed by a sermon on the epistle of the day. Um, this is the Sunday schedule. So Sunday you would get up, you would go to matins at 5 or 6 in the morning, you'd chant some psalms, probably in Latin, maybe later on in German, and then you would have a sermon on the epistle of the day. Um, Luther's practice was to read a chapter, if at all possible, if time would allow. And after the sermon followed the antiphon, the Te Deum, or Benedictus. Um, so in other words, the traditional Latin um, canticles from the medieval rite. The liturgy concludes with the Lord's Prayer, a collect, and another canticle. Um, it's, um, he was a conservative reformer. He didn't feel the need to reinvent the entire liturgy. He wanted to keep as much of the, uh, of the, of the tradition as possible. And he also wanted to keep a lot of the Latin, um, especially um, for the weekday liturgies, which was basically done in schools. He was insistent that the, uh, that, that, that the school children, or at the time, the boys, would also continue to learn Latin. At Mass, preaching would have been based on the Gospel of the day. So at Matins on Sunday morning, you preach on the Epistle. At Mass, you preach on the Gospel. Um, I won't go into any more of that because we will talk more about his uh, revision of the Mass on Tuesday. Sunday Vespers is similar to Matins with the inclusion of Psalms and Canticles, except the preaching, which would be based on the Old Testament, took place before the chanting of the Magnificat. Um, as much as possible, Luther wanted the traditional Sunday lectionary to be maintained. So he was very different from Zwingli and, as we will see, Calvin, who insisted on the system of Lectio Continua. Luther wanted to retain as much of the tradition of the lectionary as possible. Weekdays, as we said, were typically um, uh, the daily office was done in the schools. Um, he tends to deviate a little bit more from the lectionary. Um, Mondays and Tuesdays, he said, um, there should be German sermons on the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. In other words, Mondays and Tuesdays were reserved for catechetical preaching. Wednesday mornings were reserved for a preaching of the Gospel of Matthew. I find that fascinating. There's kind of a connection here to Zwingli. Zwingli started his program of expository preaching with Matthew, and uh, Luther, too, highlights Matthew as one of the important Gospels and reserves Matthew for Wednesdays. Saturday Vespers was dedicated to the Gospel of John, another important Gospel for Luther. Thursdays and Fridays would have sermons on the epistles. Um, but in all these uh, liturgies of Matins and Vespers, they would include the Psalms, often in Latin. Um, readings, the readings of scripture, they would have been done in Latin and then followed with the same reading being done in German. Again, there was sort of a uh, catechetical um, uh, mission there. He wanted the, 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 the students to learn the Latin, but at the same time, he wanted them all to understand what they were in the vernacular. Latin canticles were supplemented with German hymns. Luther was a great hymn writer. He not only wrote tunes, but he also wrote uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, texts. And unlike um, the other reformers, Luther did write hymns. Calvin, as we know, he insisted on the psalms and the canticles. The source of the congregational psalm had to come from the Bible itself. Luther expanded on this and he allowed for, um, for the um, singing of German hymns. Calvin followed a different pattern. 
for weekdays, um, he simply suggests, and this is coming from his liturgy, the form of church prayers. Um, there's a picture of the book. Uh, we will get some more of that in a minute. Um, for weekdays, he simply suggests that the minister frames some sort of exhortation to prayer, which may seem suitable to him, adapting it to the times and to the topic of his sermon. For Sunday, however, a more elaborate form is proposed. And Calvin is interesting in that he did not just take an existing preaching liturgy like Zwingli did, but Calvin completely revised the Mass, both parts of the Mass, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Table. Calvin believed himself that the Lord's Supper, which is what he would have called the Mass, that it be celebrated weekly. He wanted a weekly celebration of the Lord's Supper. He never got his way. Um, he always had to negotiate with the uh, with the with the um, municipal uh, with the municipal authorities. Um, Switzerland, I believe, was uh, made up by cantons or individual city states, and the uh, and the um, and the. Uh, church or the city council, if you will, had a lot of authority also over religious matters. Um, they did not want um, weekly celebration of the Lord's Supper. They thought four times a year would have been plenty. Um, Calvin, who worked in both Strasbourg and Geneva, tried in both places to increase that, but he was never successful. His liturgy, however, was one in which he envisioned a unity of the liturgy of the word followed by the liturgy of the table. If Lord's Supper was not to occur that given Sunday, um, you just dropped it and you just had the liturgy of the word. Uh, in practice, the same thing happened in the Church of England. In the Church of England, um, you also had um, a unified liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the table. However, in England, if nobody presented themselves to the priest to receive communion, um, uh, the priest would simply end at the end of the Liturgy of the Word, and it um, came to be known as anti-communion, not against communion, but before communion. The, uh, the, the service was an anti-communion service, um, and uh, that was common. That became very commonplace because even though a lot of the theologians wanted weekly Eucharist, the laity weren't there. You got to keep in mind that a lot of them were used to only receiving once a year which was required by the medieval church. So the idea of coming and presenting yourself for Eucharist on a weekly basis was, uh, was, was not popular. Um, so here we have Calvin's revision of the, um, of the um, Liturgy of the Word. It starts off with a greeting for Calvin. He liked the one, our help is in the name of the Lord. Um, and that is followed by a confession of sin. Um, he put his confession at the beginning, unlike Zwingli and Surigant, who had it at the end for Calvin. Confession came first. You prepared your hearts and, and, uh, by confessing your sins before hearing the word of God. This was followed by the absolution. The, uh, <coughs> The absolution was a real absolution. Um, I forgive your sins in the name of God. Um, that fast fell out of disuse. A lot of the, uh, even in the 16th century, a lot of people thought that was too Roman. But uh, Calvin and a lot of the other reforms very much believed in the power of the keys and that uh, ministers were given the authority to forgive sins just as a priest would in the medieval church. This is particularly true, um, this is another lecture in itself, but a lot of the reformers, in addition uh, to revising the, uh, the Mass and Baptism and the Liturgy of the Word, they also revived um, public penance. Um, so in Calvin you will have uh, forms for excommunication and also forms for the reconciliation of a penitent. Um, and in these liturgies, um, and these also occurred in the Church of Scotland, um, you would have a very, very, very vivid um, absolution 
Um, even Cranmer, uh, in his reforms, envisioned a liturgy of reconciliation. It doesn't appear in the prayer book, but it appears in what he envisioned as a uh, revision of canon law. Um, Cranmer envisioned a threefold reform of the Church of England. One was a religious reform, which was brought about through the Articles of Religion. The second was a liturgical reform, which was brought about through the Books of Common Prayer. And the third was a revision of canon law, uh, which he completed through a book called the Reformatio Ecclesiasticorum, the uh, Reformation of Ecclesiastical Laws. It was, I think, completed in 1551, but did not pass Parliament. In England, all the, all, you know, even the Book of Common Prayer has to be passed by Parliament. They never passed the, uh, his revision of, um, <clears throat> of canon law. Um, and then, of course, soon after, uh, Queen Mary came to power, and then when Queen Elizabeth came, uh, returned to power and England became Protestant again, uh, Elizabeth wanted nothing to do with the revision of canon law, realizing that if the canon law was revised, that might apply to the crown, and she wanted a very strong centralized um, crown. Um, so she thought, we're better off with no canon law. Um, so, uh, so the Reformatio was, was never ratified par Parliament, it was never, uh, it was never became an official part of the Church of England. However, in this huge tome of canon law is buried this wonderful, wonderful liturgy of reconciliation. And it has w these wonderful rituals where the penitent appears in the back of the church at the entrance of the church dressed in white, would come forward, would confess their sins, and then there was this uh, very, very strong absolution that was not only pronounced by the priest, but all the people shared in absolving the penitent from, from, from their sins. So there was this big movement among many, many reformed churches to restoring this sort of uh, public penance and then public um, uh, reconciliation. The Anabaptists as well. We don't have much evidence from the Anabaptists, but one we'll look at him more in his Eucharistic um, writings by the name of Balthasar Hubmeier. He is one of the Anabaptists who penned three liturgies. They probably weren't used, but they do contain how he envisioned three liturgies. Um, one was a revision of the Eucharistic rite, one was a uh, revision of the baptismal rite, and the third was a, uh, was, was, was a liturgy for public um, um, reconciliation. So that was a very important thing. So absolution, it was definitely a part of the, uh, of, um, of the uh, early Reformation that, uh, that continued from the medieval church. The absolution is followed by the Ten Commandments. Does anybody find that odd? following confession and absolution with the con Ten Commandments. Does that order seem a little odd to anybody? What happens in the Book of Common Prayer, you Episcopalians? During Lent, you sometimes use the penitential order. What is the order in the Book of Common Prayer? The Decalogue first. The Decalogue first, and that's followed by confession. Why is that? Um, it helps you think of things to confess, I guess. Yeah. One of the uses of the law is to bring a person to realize their sinfulness and brings them to um, a state of confession. Calvin, for some reason, reverses that. And that is rooted in his theology of what he coined the third use of the law. Now, Calvin wasn't the first to do this liturgically. Calvin had a lot of predecessors in Geneva and Strasbourg who he also borrowed from and who he was in conversation with. In Strasbourg you had the uh, uh, Martin Busser who pastored a lot to the German congregation in Geneva, um, Guillaume Farrell who he also uh, was in contact with and I think Farrell also had this order where the Ten Commandments follow the, uh, the confession and the absolution. Calvin's third use of the law was that the law doesn't merely condemn us but it shows us how we are to live. It shows us what we are to strive for. Um, a very interesting and more positive understanding of the law.
And I can tell you from personal experience, it works. Um, I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church, and when I was a child, we followed that order. Um, we had the confession of sin. It was followed not by the absolution. We dropped the absolution by then. It was called the assurance of pardon, and it basically was a scripture reading that said that our sins would be forgiven. It was scripture that had the authority to forgive sins, not the minister or the priest. But that was then followed by, the, uh, by, by a reading of the Decalogue. Uh, as I got into my teen years, reading the Decalogue every week got a little old, so they started just doing the summary of the law. And then after a while they just decided, well, that's getting kind of old too, why don't we just read something else to the, about the scriptures that tells us how we are to live a holy life. But when I was very, very young, I remember reading the Decalogue every year. Um, I remember when I was taking this course, uh, gosh, many years ago, uh, Thomas Schattauer, a Lutheran, was the, uh, was the um, professor. And he told a story about how he fell in love with liturgy. He said how he was a child, he would, you know, he would be following along in the liturgy and then it came time to the Decalogue and, you know, it came time to read the Ten Commandments and he would say, ah, didn't do that, didn't do that, didn't do that. For me, growing up, it was very different. It was, oh, I can do that. I can do that, I can do that. So it's a very different, a very wonderful way of understanding the Decalogue. So it's one of the things that Calvin did that, um, that, was, uh, that, that was actually quite, uh, quite um, innovative and uh, liturgical, liturgically beautiful. In the Book of Common Prayer, um, 1549 and 1552, um, and I think 1562 as well, um, the Decalogue enters into, uh, into the, um, into the uh, Sunday morning liturgy. Um, as you said, it appears before the confession, but after each commandment, according to the earlier versions, the congregation responded to each commandment with the words, Amen, Lord have mercy, and write these thy laws on our hearts. So it's kind of like both sides of it. Yes, amen, Lord have mercy. The law condemns you and brings you to confession. But, and write these thy laws in our hearts, sort of points to the future. Write these laws so we know how to, how to live our lives in the future. And that was done after every, every single commandment. When they revised the Book of Common Prayer for the Episcopal Church in 1979, um, they dropped the second part. So they just had Amen, Lord have mercy, after every commandment, with the exception of the Tenth Commandment. At the end of the Tenth Commandment, it was Amen, Lord have mercy, and write all these thy laws on our hearts. So the, uh, I find that unfortunate that they, that they, that they did that, because um, it, it made the reading of the Decalogue even, even more penitential than it, than, it, than, it, than it had been in the past. <clears throat> All right, enough on the Ten Commandments. Uh, after that, you had a singing in the psalm, a singing of the psalm, at least in Strasbourg. This form of church prayers appears in two or three editions, some from Strasbourg, some from Geneva, because Calvin ministered in both uh, cities. Um, Strasbourg likes singing, I think, a little bit more than Geneva. Um, and, uh, but they sang in Geneva too, but it actually was a part, the singing of the psalm was specified in the liturgy in the Strasbourg version. And then you have what I will call the prayer for illumination. Um, the important part of the prayer for illumination is that there be an invocation of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will um, fall upon, first of all, the preacher, that he may faithfully expound upon the Word of God, and then also that the Holy Spirit will fall upon the people, that they will be receptive to the Word of God. Um, and uh, that, again, wasn't original to Calvin. Um, Farrell and uh, Bootser and others had that as well. And if you will notice, even Surgant, he had, you know, a prayer to the Holy Spirit in his liturgy before the sermon as well. But that's interesting because we often associate, um, liturgical scholars often associate the invocation of the Holy Spirit with the Eucharistic prayer. And we even give it that fancy Greek name, Epiclesis. Right? That you ask the Holy Spirit to fall upon the gifts that they will become for us the body and blood of Christ. Um, and for uh, the Episcopal Church and many other traditions, also that the Holy Spirit will fall upon the people of God, that, uh, that they will receive the body and blood of Christ. But here for Calvin and for the other reformers, um, it was intended for the sermon. <clears throat> 
So that's followed by the scripture in the sermon. Calvin followed Zwingli and many of the other reformers in believing that you have a program of Lexio Continua. Um, Luther kept the liturgical year. Zwingli dispensed with it entirely. Calvin mostly dispensed with it. Um, he was a little bit ambivalent to Christmas. Um, if, uh, if all of a sudden it was December 25th, he might suspend um, his, his, uh, his preaching through of a particular book of the Bible, and he might say something about Christmas. So he wasn't quite, you know, there's, there's, there's debate on, on, on how much he opposed Christmas. Later on, the Puritans again would oppose Christmas. Um, in England, um, during the uh, interregnum, when the Puritans took over from 1645 to 1660, Christmas was banned. Um, there was no Christmas in England. Um, so, yeah, so you begin at a particular book of the Bible, you preach your way through, and then once you finish, you start another book of the Bible, and you basically preach your way through. As you know, Calvin also wrote many commentaries, biblical commentaries. I always wondered how those, how those, um, how those work together. Um, and I often think about, you know, we learned earlier about Lex Credendi, Lex Credendi. What was the relationship with, with Calvin? How much did his commentaries influence what he preached about? And more interestingly, did anything he preached about influence his commentaries? So maybe someone will write a dissertation, or maybe someone did on that. But that was his method. Um, like Luther, and I don't know exactly how he did this, but like Luther, he also specified what to preach on on what days. So Sunday mornings was typically you preach in the gospel. Sunday afternoons you would preach maybe on the Old Testament. Um, weekdays you would preach on the Old Testament or on the epistles. But he divvied it up so it's so you know you wouldn't only hear one book of the Bible for three months. You know there would be there would be different different uh, streams going on. You know, Sunday mornings, you know, you'd, you'd pre be preaching through one of the Gospels. Sunday afternoons, you might be preaching on through one of the epistles. Uh, weekday services, which of course, no, but not everybody would attend, but again, probably would have been used in schools and things like that. It would be more intense and, you, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd preach through things uh, more frequently, either the Old Testament or the epistles. Then you have the intercessions followed by a paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. Paraphrasing the Lord's Prayer was very popular. Luther did this as well. Um, so you have three ways of praying the Lord's Prayer. You can either pray it by the words according to the Bible, um, pray it or sing it. Um, you could do a metrical version of it and sing that as we did earlier today, or you could have a paraphrase of it. Um, so different ways of uh, using the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> and then would follow the Lord's Supper. Um, the rubrics in his liturgy says, if the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, this is what you do. Um, but usually it wouldn't have been done. So after the intercessions, you sing another psalm, and then you would have a blessing and people would go home. Um, you went to church a lot, especially on Sunday. Um, there were at least, Luther had three services, matins, mass, and vespers. Calvinists typically had two, in the morning and the afternoon, um, or evening. I even remember that growing up. I had to go to church twice on Sunday, um, which I thought was a lot. Now I'm a Catholic organist and I go four times. Um, so I guess twice wasn't, wasn't, um, wasn't that bad after all. But the sermons were long. Um, half an hour to an hour would have been the typical length of a sermon. I grew up, Sunday mornings would have been a 40-minute sermon. Sunday afternoons, which I preferred, was about a 20-minute sermon. Um, I also liked the Sunday afternoon sermon uh, service better because that was the service where we always said the Apostles' Creed, which I kind of liked. And the other thing I liked is this strange tradition, doesn't date from the, uh, from the Reformation, but it was sort of a quirky little thing. After the sermon, people would get to request a hymn. Um, or hymns. And of course, being good Calvinists, you know, you would listen very intently to the sermon and you would pick hymns or psalms that, uh, that of course, would have reflected um, the content of the sermon. And, you know, people kind of show off, ah, I picked the perfect hymn that really comments well on that sermon. Um, but that's sort of the, uh, that's sort of the spirit of the Calvinist. Um, now for a little bit more show. I think I have time.
yes, just a few minutes. This is a copy of the Genevan Bible. Um, this appears in 1567. Um, again, this is a copy from the Beinecke. Uh, beautiful, beautiful copy. Um, what's different about this is, um, oh, here we have it, the cover page, the Bible. It's written in French, of course. Um, uh, Calvin, uh, who probably would have used this Bible, um, he uh, ministered to the French congregation. You can see there are lots of images in here, woodcuts, but they're not images of saints or, or other things like that, but they were things that sort of explained. Um, so here you have, um, this is from the uh, book of Exodus. So they would sort of, uh, I imagine that that is a picture of the tabernacle or, 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 or different things that would have been um, described in the Bible and you would illustrate them. Um, and here, this is also interesting, maps. And they would fold out. Maps and here, so you would have maps of, uh, of uh, ancient Israel, you'd have maps perhaps of, uh, of uh, Paul's missionary journeys and things like that. Um, these continued in Protestant Bibles to when I was a kid. Um, the Bible saved me from boredom in many a sermon. I knew my Bible maps cold because during the sermon when I got bored I would turn to the back of the Bible and I would look at it and study all the maps. Um, so you have maps. Um, you have the Psalms. These are the Psalms that would have been translated from the Hebrew. Um, and these appear as the Book of Psalms where they would appear in the Bible. But in addition to that, you would have the metrical Psalms. These are the Psalms, um, um, what came to be known as the Genevan Psalter. Um, and they were, uh, they were composed by, uh, the, the poetry was composed by uh, Maro and uh, Theodore de Beze, who were the leading French poets of the day. Calvin didn't just let anybody translate the, the Psalms. He got the leading poets of the day to, trans, to translate them. And the Genevan Psalms are actually wonderful. They all have different meters. In England, they all followed common meter, you know, this, the 868686 the eight, 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 um, pattern. Um, the Genevan Psalms just followed all kinds of metrical s patterns. During the day, some people who didn't like them called them Genevan jigs. Um, and they would have been you know, uplifting. So you had the metrical psalms. Um, you have an index, um, so sort of like a, a, a concordance at the end. So this was a Bible that was used for study as well. And, um, oh, here you have a couple of the canticles. Um, you have the uh, Ten Commandments. You have the Canticle of Simeon. And, uh, oh, and then on the bottom of the page, that's an interesting, can anybody read that? Prayer after the meal. So, um, so this was not only a, a, a Bible that would have been used at church, but this would have been a Bible that would have been used in the home and it provided domestic prayers, which I find very interesting. So you would sing after your meal um, and you would sing a prayer. <clears throat> um, and then here comes this liturgy um, from which we discussed earlier. The form of church prayers um, is what it is called. And he had in here, um, this is the form for administering baptism. This is the form for celebrating the supper. Here you have the form for celebrating marriage. And here you have, on the left-hand page, a form for the visitation of the sick. And, of course, the Bible would also contain the catechism. Now, his forms were, the, a lot of them did contain um, prayer texts, or at least examples of prayer texts. He didn't expect the ministers necessarily to use these word for word like the expectation would have been in the Church of England with the Book of Common Prayer, but he gave examples. Um, one place, interestingly enough, where he 
intentionally did not give an example was, I think it was the Strasbourg version of this, where he did not give an example of the prayer for illumination. Um, he was very insistent that that be a prayer that be extemporaneous. You are praying for the Spirit, the Spirit should be able to come down into you and inspire you to create that prayer extemporaneously. So there was a lot of freedom, so you weren't stuck to a particular form, but at the same time, um, examples were given. Um, now this is what's interesting. I separated here the form of church prayers. The, strictly speaking, liturgical part of the book from the rest of the Bible, and it's like 16 or 18 pages. So on the one hand, you could say that the liturgy has been diminished, and now it's all about the Bible, and the liturgy is just a thin sliver of, uh, of, of what you experienced. But the other way of looking at it is with this whole idea of Lexio Continua, and the preaching being the principal Litur liturgical service for the congregation and where you are reading through large chunks of the Bible. Typically you would read through a chapter if time were allowed. In the Lutheran Church, for Zwingli, for Calvin. You just don't read a few verses. You preach on as many verses as, as you can, but the typical tradition was to at least read through a chapter. In essence, this entire book, the entire Bible, became the liturgical book of the Reformation. So that's the Liturgy of the Word. Um, and the importance of the Bible in preaching in used in three very different ways. For Zwingli, it was a unique liturgy of the word that he developed out of medieval precedence of the medieval preaching uh, tradition. For Luther, you just inserted preaching, the reading and the preaching, into the existing liturgies of the day without messing too much with it. And for Calvin, you just revise the entire Mass, Liturgy of the Word, Liturgy of the Eucharist, and that part for the Liturgy of the Word became your basis for the preaching liturgy.